It's safe to say most of us take for granted things like the ability to mail something or make a phone call. But getting mail anywhere, even in far out places where it's not profitable to do so, is only possible because public institutions exist side by side with commercial ones. But how might that work in the age of artificial intelligence? I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called Autocruise. You simply set the speed you want. Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two years. How the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte action I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with humans. This episode, it's the latest installment of our oral history project. I'm Nick Marta. I'm our technical lead for AI governance at Mozilla, where I'm working on both technical and governance interventions to help make AI safer. Before I joined Mozilla, I was most recently at the White House, where I worked on AI policy. So I love to approach a lot of these problems from both the technical and policy perspective. Mozilla is the nonprofit that's behind Firefox, and it is also a nonprofit that is focused on protecting an open public internet. It's about making sure that the internet works for everyone and is a a public good that folks around the world can use to achieve their greatest aspirations and access information from around the world and do so on top of an incentive structure that isn't just the commercial incentive structure that exists on the internet as well. When you step outside in a medium or a large city, and you look at the road for a couple of minutes, you'll see many cars, and every once in a while, you'll also see a bus. And it's a perfect example of how infrastructure is being used by both private and public actors. And if you want to travel across a city, you can choose to either take a private car or a taxi or a bus or a subway, right? You have all of these different options, some public, some private, to get across the city depending on your particular needs, how much you're willing to pay, how much time you're willing to spend in transit. And you see this sort of juxtaposition of both public and private counterparts in many different industries and ecosystems across society. If you want to send mail to somebody across the country, you can choose between, say, UPS or the U.S. Postal Service. If you're looking at channels on the television, you can choose between, say, a public broadcaster like PBS or a commercial network like NBC. And so we have these historical examples of both public and private counterparts. And this has been really important because it leads to a healthier economy and healthier society when you have public options that exist alongside private counterparts. One way to think about it is that private innovation can help expand the frontier of what's possible with the new technology. It can help unlock new advances. It can create new opportunities. And it can really expand a greater reach for those technologies as well, because commercial incentives can often help accelerate the adoption of technology at a much faster pace. However, commercial incentives are often the wrong set of incentives to also ensure that these technological advances are being used to serve a greater set of needs that might not be profitable or might not be prioritized by industry. Ensuring expanded access to this technology, for example, might not be commercially viable. You can think about, for example, how uh, the United States Postal Service is required to serve everyone across the country, even in the most rural parts of the country, where it might not be profitable for UPS or FedEx to provide the highest quality, quickest services. And so there's a similar analogy here where public AI alternatives to this robust private AI ecosystem that we've seen emerge over the past few years would be a really important counterpart for making sure that AI actually serves everyone. And we're starting to see these public AI alternatives emerge. We have some governments subsidizing access to computational resources. 
We have a few nonprofit AI labs collectively putting nearly a billion dollars into open source AI research and models. And these sorts of interventions and alternatives are really making the start of a dent in creating real public alternatives to private AI innovation. But they're nowhere near the scale and scope needed to be of a similar order of magnitude as what we're seeing in the private AI ecosystem, which is putting hundreds of billions of dollars behind these technologies. So what we're calling for is what we call public AI, which is really a bold set of initiatives to create a public AI ecosystem that can provide a meaningful counterpoint to the private AI ecosystem. And that doesn't mean replacing private AI innovation. It means providing an alternative that can exist side by side with private AI innovation, giving consumers and developers and people at large the choice between either public or private AI alternatives at each part of the AI ecosystem, whether you're building a model uh, or using it in a commercial application or your consumer choosing which product you want to pick for your particular application, you can choose between either public or private alternatives. To make public AI alternatives work at scale, we're going to need public AI alternatives in each part of the AI ecosystem. So that means having public alternatives for data, for models, for labor, for thinking about how we create public alternatives at each layer of this AI stack. And so next steps concretely look like public institutions, broadly defined to include governments and nonprofits, civil society groups, will need to start and continue pushing for creating these public alternatives at each layer of the stack. And I'll give you a concrete example of the type of initiative that is the type of thing that will need to be scaled up and replicated in different contexts. So we have a platform called Common Voice, which solicits voice data from folks around the world where people essentially donate their voice by recording themselves speaking in their native language and uploading it to this platform, which then basically collates language from around the world in different languages and makes that accessible to AI developers who want to build AI models in different languages. And what that does is it creates this open data set that folks can use to build AI models in different languages that might not be as profitable as building it in English or another set of languages that have a large commercial marketplace for those products. So you can imagine folks who are trying to build AI applications in a small community, a certain language speakers in Sub-Saharan Africa or Indonesia, uh, using this common voice platform to build an AI model there where that model might not be profitable, but it helps solve an important local need. And that's the sort of thing where if profit is the incentive, as it is in the commercial AI ecosystem, it might not get done. And the benefits of AI might not reach these communities. But when you take out the profit incentive and instead center public AI development on the public interest, you can help incentivize these types of applications that might not otherwise get done. Support for this program comes from LinkedIn Ads, helping you reach the professionals who are more likely to find your ad relevant, with targeting capabilities by job title, industry, company, and more. Did you know that 79% of B2B content marketers say LinkedIn produces the best results for paid media? And when it comes to technology specifically, LinkedIn generates two to five times higher return on ad spend than other social media platforms. Plus, LinkedIn ads helps you build the right relationships and reach your customers in a respectful environment. With direct access to decision makers, a billion members, and 10 million C-level executives. Start converting your B2B audience into high-quality leads, and we'll give you a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash build to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash build. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. So one of my favorite examples is around detecting illegal mining operations. 
There's this group called Sand Mining Watch, and it's a web-based sand mining and sand resource monitoring system. And it focuses on monitoring for illegal sand mining in river systems in India. And essentially what they're trying to do is build these open source, AI-based sand mining detection tools so that they can detect these illegal sand mines. And it's the type of thing that is really important for environmental protection, right? These mines can be really harmful to local communities and to the environment broadly, and AI can help detect them. And there's this group of folks who are working on developing this tool that don't have the largest set of commercial backers behind it because it's not something that's inherently profitable, right? There's not uh, money to be made in detecting these illegal mining operations necessarily, even though it provides real value to uh, government and environmental regulators who want to crack down on these operations. So this is a type of program where having public support for that, and we've been a part of supporting this specific program through Mozilla's technology fund that backs this project. This is the type of thing where public support can really help support an AI application that isn't the public interest but might not be profitable. And there are examples like this across the board. There are examples of people using AI to facilitate deliberative democracy, the idea of making it easier to talk to folks in your community to help come to better answers for what governments should do on thorny policy problems. There is work to try to use AI to match cancer patients to the best clinical trials for them. That's also the type of work where more public support for that can help accelerate that work when it might not be immediately commercially viable or have a clear profit incentive attached to it. On top of that, there are all sorts of other AI infrastructure projects throughout the compute resources needed for AI development, for the data needed for AI development, for the model training needed for AI development, where putting public incentives rather than commercial incentives in the mix can help create a different type of building AI. So rather than seeing what you see in the commercial ecosystem right now, where most AI development tends to be relatively closed, folks don't want to release that much information about the AI model that they've developed or the specific data that was used to train the AI model. You can imagine when you put public incentives rather than commercial incentives behind the development of these systems, you end up getting more open and transparent AI systems. And I'd point to the Allen Institute as a good example of this, where it's a nonprofit that is developing AI models and they're making them very open and transparent because they're not out to make money off these models. They're out to create this public good for folks who want to use AI, who want to question it, study it, understand it, and apply it to public interest applications. And they don't have to try to conceal trade secrets or proprietary information or things that might get them in legal trouble in the same way that a lot of the large commercial actors who are creating AI systems have to do. There are certainly risks and challenges to public AI. I don't want to act like this is going to be easy or that it's going to be free, but I believe these challenges are manageable. Public AI initiatives are going to require sustainable revenue models to be able to exist long term and remain competitive in the marketplace. And I think it's helpful to look at the history of open source software in this context, where you look at projects like Firefox and Linux being backed by the Mozilla Foundation and the Linux Foundation, respectively, as examples of where there's been this longer term funding source to support these public alternatives to commercial players in the software ecosystem. And we're going to need to see similar things like that in the public AI ecosystem. So whether that's government's backing or nonprofits and philanthropies or some combination thereof, there certainly will need to be funding sources for this work. And I think to get to the concern that I think many listeners would rightly have, which is asking the question of whether this means taxpayers are going to be on the hook for spending the same amount as OpenAI to develop you know, the equivalent of GPT-5, I don't think that's the right question to be asking here. Because I don't think we're trying to create public alternatives for everything that the private sector is doing here. In fact, I think it's worth asking the question of whether it is useful to have a public alternative 
for, say, GPT-5? And I think that's a question we need to debate more broadly across society. But I think it's very possible that the answer to that question actually ends up being no, that it's actually more important and a better use of public resources to focus on creating public alternatives for, say, GPT-3.5 or GPT-4 and for other types of AI models and smaller AI models and more domain-specific AI models. So I don't think I should be taken as a default that we're talking about creating public alternatives for everything across the AI ecosystem, but rather where it's most important to have public alternatives to create the type of uh, innovation and diffusion and adoption of AI that we want for public applications. I would also point to a couple other challenges here. I think one, is that there's actually a risk of this public AI work becoming successful in the wrong direction. And what I mean by that is we're not just talking about or trying to expand access to AI indiscriminately, right? We're trying to expand access to trustworthy AI. We're trying to make it so that as we increase public support for AI and we increase public adoption of AI, we're doing it in a way that puts trust front and center rather than having it be a byproduct. And I think it's possible if we do this work wrong, we're just talking about increasing AI across society writ large without prioritizing trust. And that wouldn't really be success, right? I think there are a lot of harms we've seen in the commercial AI ecosystem, and we're not trying to replicate that. And so it'll be important to embed trusted and safety best practices into public AI projects from the start. And I'm optimistic that the incentive structuring we're talking about in public AI can make that a lot easier, because when projects are focused on the public interest from the beginning, rather than turning a profit, it makes it a little bit easier to prioritize safety from the start rather than having it be an afterthought to profit. And part of how we're pushing on public AI is to try to also in parallel, make it easier to build trustworthy AI models and tools and applications from the beginning by opening up access to more tools and benchmarks and valuation frameworks to test AI systems for safety, to incorporate safety best practices throughout the development lifecycle. And a real public AI initiative will be doing this across the board so that as we expand public AI, we're also expanding trustworthy AI at the same time. This episode was produced by me and Emma Silicons and mixed by Garrett Lang with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong.